of relax and enjoy watching our guest speaker. I'm pleased to invite Brent Phillips. Many of you know Brent. He has been involved in the deaf community his entire life. There was at one moment where he wanted to become the Prime Minister of Australia, I remember. But yes, he has played a very important part in the deaf community here in Victoria. He's been a member of Deaf Victoria. He has had many, many different career opportunities and goals that he has worked in Deaf Victoria, sorry, Expression Australia. And after eight years of being involved in Expression Australia, he now works for the NDIA. Brent is very motivated about deaf leadership. We often talk about how we can support and achieve this. We both share a common goal to see deaf people succeed. So I'm really excited to watch Brent's presentation tonight about deaf leadership. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Brent. Wonderful, thank you, Kathy, and thank you to Victoria for inviting me to speak here at Grand GM this evening. Deaf Victoria, previously known as VCON, has been a huge part of my life. And looking around this room this evening, I'm probably the second or third oldest in the room, so it's quite a while in terms of feeling my age, but there's great uh, energy youth in the room for this individual to be part of Deaf Victoria, so from this lens, it feels a little bit different. Looking back to my first ever public presentation, it was the State Deaf Conference back in 1997, and maybe some of you probably know it, Jane, I was there, but it was at the old JSSC Hall, the old Victoria Society site. I was invited as a Deaf Victorian youth member, and I signed like the clappers, and I think Karen Clear was interpreting at the time and struggle, so I must say I've come along with my, my presentation skills and I'm much more confident and I'm very pleased to be here with you all tonight. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that have been in the past, present and present this evening. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to deaf elders and leaders, especially those who established in Victoria or their colonial elections ago. And some of them who are no longer with us, such as Anne Darwin, John Lovett, to name a few, who are involved in establishing this wonderful organisation who are no longer here in person but in spirit. I'd like to pay my respects and also to the new young emerging leaders out there as well. My presentation will focus on various themes, but overall it is about deaf leadership. I'll be talking about traditional pathways of deaf leadership and look back at what's occurred in the space of 30 years. I'll also talk about the current trends and what the leadership pathways are for deaf people in 2020 and beyond, and also look at where we want to go. And, and I'll talk a little bit about my own journey as a deaf person and how I developed that. I'll also talk about the ally concept, which has cropped up a number of times, and I'll share my thoughts on what is an ally and deaf leadership and the importance of having deaf led allyship. And I'll also talk about my perspective on Deaf Victoria and their role in supporting deaf leadership and some thoughts around the broader deaf sector. And what role do we all play in supporting deaf leadership and that movement? Whilst I was trying to put my PowerPoint together, um, I looked back at a number of photos from 30 or 40 years ago from different train out and So some of these photographs will come up, don't get lost in your past. Rob Adam, hopefully, you're still watching from Scotland. I've got a photograph of you there with Jill Mullard, Rebecca Adam, Robert Lee, some of those individuals in that picture, Chris Dunn, Bertrand and Hutchins, the previous VCOD board that existed, I think, probably back in 
that was the American product probably the next thing, and now like that. I wanted to launch the project and with the digital wallet with these historical photographs are extremely valuable and I'm so glad you did take the time to hold on to these pictures because this is how we got the powers next to all those individuals and pioneers have been part of the journey. And these photographs will pop up through our presentation tonight. Now, before I talk about deep leadership, I'd like to take a step back and look at leadership as a whole. I think during 2020, it's been an extraordinary year for leadership throughout the globe. As you should be aware, many people who live in Victoria will be known as Daniel Andrews, our current premier. There was less for this extraordinary time of COVID, the better, the worse. And there are polarizing views. Some people are very supportive of the premier and the actions he took, and others not so. To take the claims with criticism. Daniel Andrews, as a leader, stood up every day for over 120 days straight in press conferences to respond to questions from journalists and gave COVID updates daily. Going from a serious scenario from 700 COVID numbers down to zero. Is that an example of leadership? I believe so. He fronted up every day and took responsibility and accountability. Whilst he had his critics, the hotel quarantine issues, there were pros and cons, and then leadership is not always positive. So I think it's good to reflect upon Daniel and his leadership that occurred throughout this year, and his leadership has shown a lot from his responsibilities. Then we have the American scenario of the American election of Trump and Biden. Leadership, and we've seen the behaviour that's occurred throughout the year, throughout the debates, <coughs> and even once the election took place, Biden. Being president elect, establishing very committed person committees that has the funding, no existing support, his hands have been tied, and the uh, outgoing president hasn't conceded that he lost the election, and these are all these issues. So we've seen the dirty laundry being made over in the United States through the election process, and it still goes on. But that will have huge impacts on national security and various other aspects of the United States because. Uh, at the start of the year, we looked at the Dev Leadership Program that was going to be launched, and I remember that going along to the Dev in the Trade Ball Cafe with a number of you. It was a lovely warm day, it was February, it was alive, it was great, it was normal, we could hug each other, have drinks, get together, no social distancing. It was wonderful. And then what happened? COVID came. The Dev Leadership Program paused. And Expression Australia created this pivotal program with Victoria and the CEO uh, left. They advertised the Victoria recruitment process for the CEO of Expression Australia. There was a lot of talk about what's happening to the leadership because it was the CEO and it became a whole topic in the community. What is the leadership? And that's cropped up a number of times this year. Then again, over in the United States, globally, we had the other Black Lives Matter, that movement that we've seen. Black rights and the impacts it had on the other university, the other deaf university in the world. So the deaf community wanted to ask the president of the Gower Deaf University because they were paying their respects to black individuals. And Gower Deaf had one day to be between the president, uh, Lorraine Sims, who is the current chief of diversity, the chief diversity officer. Is responsible for diversity, including race, LGBT, gender, and so forth. And there was an hour long debate, so if you haven't had the opportunity to hear that, you must include it's one of the most powerful things I've seen. It's a very raw, deep conversation around privilege, growing up white, having access, and thinking about unconscious bias. Of course, totally drawn to that minority. If you haven't seen that, I do encourage you to do so. It's catching that it is in that itself. I know it's something. So those events have certainly opened our eyes in terms of good examples of leadership and not so good examples of leadership that occurred throughout the globe this year. And it seems to see that at a broader level before we're going down into deaf leadership and what that means for us. I talked about our traditional pathways of deaf leadership. Historically, over the last 30 years, you can see these two photographs I have on this slide. The first one is the Deaf Committee. That was before we got 
So it's a group of mostly men who got to meet and talk about various issues that cropped up that was affecting the deaf community at the time. So that group, uh, the person standing on the left was my grandfather, Joe Phillips. And then we've got Matt Adam, who's a young man there, Beryl Vigan, some of you in the room can probably know Beryl, and uh, Eli Nobel, Melody Dyson, those individuals who are driven by the deaf community, the deaf community, and led a group of um, the gentlemen who all pursued about them and professional at the time. And that was prior to the Victorian Council of the Deaf. The second photograph there is the organising committee for Joe Griffith, the one who came that occurred in Brisbane in 1999, and Al McEwen was the facilitator of Convener, if you like. And I was involved in the Olympic concert, as some of you may recognise, selling uh, Strawbridge to an IRA door back to some of you other people. Anyway, so looking back over the last 70 years, what is important is that what we had in the past was deaf schools, we had deaf clubs that existed, we had consistent exposure to those deaf role models. Remembering growing up, I came from deaf family, deaf grandparents, I went to Genesis the Offer to the deaf club, my grandma would take me upstairs on Thursday and have a chat with the older deaf members that I had rich exposure to their life genius, their experience, their advice, their wisdom. And many others who were there at the time had that exposure, but unfortunately we've lost that. Access to deaf events, deaf spaces, John Watts Square Social Club, various other deaf clubs that occurred in the suburbs, so many events throughout the calendar, every community events, being together for the pub, sporting events, and so forth. There were many retreats, leadership retreats, and you were involved in some of those deaf youth camps that occurred time and time again. And looking back over all those years, my most positive experience was going to campus. So it was always a full weekend or a long weekend, you got together, um, got together in groups, workshop ideas, like minded people were able to get together and communicate. It was such a rich setting for a different client myself. I thought the friendships and then these little changes for the rest of my life enhanced my confidence, my self esteem. All those years ago, those were trends and camps that I participated in. A strong volunteer culture. I think almost everybody in the deaf community were involved in something, whether it was a deaf basketball club or they volunteer for the VCOL. There was always some involvement in the part of the community. They made the time and they contributed to the community. When they made the time, it meant that they were able to learn from one another, see each other face to face, and support one another. But also, there were many people who had factory jobs, deaf people were builders. Ordinary jobs that existed then. And then they were still respected, they were president of the ECOD and they had leadership roles in the deaf community. But even if the day jobs, they were just working as a carpenter or a gardener. This was back then. There were systemic issues and barriers and didn't even necessarily have access to pathways and training opportunities. And through the deaf community, they made breakthroughs and were able to excel in voluntary capacities, but not in paid capacities, maybe then. So we look at contemporary pathways around leadership. At the moment, we have a somewhat fragmented deaf community. We don't have one place that we gather. It depends on your interests, the area in which you live, your hobbies, and also intersectionality. It's become a more accepted, visible presence within the community group. Historically, it was the deaf community as a whole, but now we have deaf Muslim groups, deaf women's groups, uh, and various multicultural deaf groups as well. The deaf professionals, we have so many more deaf professionals working out there in the corporate world and the government sector than they ever did exist in the past. Deaf societies, for instance, traditional welfare organisations that are now much more commercial and business driven, looking at income, profits, and have become much more commercial than what they were initially. Better supports and better services for deaf people to access mainstream society. In universities we have interpreters. Historically, we now you can have technology, interpreters, 
EBRAs and the three connect triggers for your regular appointments, one age and one price. If I decide to be partaking training, I can seek out parts of many as I've learned to make support for my communication needs. More people in the community in the mainstream are aware of access to what it means to interpret the Oslan and the community, much more than they have been before. Because of the presence of Oslan interpreters on the television, day in, day out, People have become familiar with our language, our culture, the deaf community that does exist because of the exposure to sign language on television and in the media. It would be more accepted in the mainstream because the mainstream community is much more aware of our community language and culture. Deaf people are now also part of mainstream, mainstream leadership courses and training, such as the AICD, the Australian Institute of Culture and Directors, AICD, which I I was involved in with Gavin Bell Harry and Elizabeth Fisher, where we had support provided by Especially Australia. And the networks there were incredible. The people we got to work on the side with, their business journey, their careers, the knowledge that they shared, we learned so much from those young individuals. Previously, a lot of deaf people did workshops in house that were quite secondary from the hearing or mainstream sector, but now we're out there seeing best practices in government and training when we have that exposure. Melissa Hale recently became involved in the Women's Community Leadership Program, and that's a high profile community leadership program. And uh, she's a signal for deaf people to be involved in that. So there are programs out there for deaf people who are being involved in mainstream hearing practices and they have access to interpreting funding far more than what they would have in the past. However, the implications of COVID. I'm here tonight with about 10 or 15 people in the room, and I'm certainly not used to that. Will it go back to normal, or will it definitely be different? And how will we interact in the engagement? That deaf space concept will it be the same, or will it be different? Will we go out, camp together, have workshops together, or will there be less or more of that? What was successful in the past was people gathering face to face, learning from one another, and sharing those experiences, advising and learning from people's journeys in the same way. We always have the same benefits through Zoom. I'm not so sure, but I do hope that life goes back to normal for the deaf community because the space for the deaf community is absolutely critical. And I'll just bring that back a to explain my particular photograph. This photograph here, some of you may remember, was in Paris. We had a WFD Congress last year in France, and all the deaf societies pitched um, in to support the and that's a photograph of um, Australian and New Zealand young deaf participants. Uh, the passions and this field are just incredible. And some of those individuals need to answer the scratch of having pay our respects to those people. I wanted to talk a little bit about how we should aspire to the future and where we wish to make in terms of destination. And I think that for deaf people to succeed, there are different kind of ways. They might want to be a leader in the mainstream, be a professional, a business leader, or they may wish to lead a deaf society or be part of the deaf community. It might be through sports or civic, whether they become an MP or a councillor. We should encourage all deaf individuals to achieve their personal goals and directions, not just for the deaf community, but also as part of the mainstream. And there are double benefits because deaf people have a lot to offer and giving people benefit from a deaf game. So I'd like to go back to individual goals, aspirations, and how we support them in their career path to ensure that they head in the most appropriate direction. We should aim to have a strong and sustainable LMD learning development program. And I think that's where, especially in Australia, with their uh, leadership program could be tremendous. Could be right investment, partners, commitments. We certainly can see that excel and children is consistent. We could build in retreats, camps for young people, and giving young people the ability to grow and develop. But I look forward to being part of that process and supporting it. Not only learning and development within the deaf community, but partnering with the uh, Victoria and other external stakeholders to demonstrate that we're open and we can benefit from best practice that occurs out there in contemporary leadership concepts and practices that currently do exist. So partnering is key. And also reflecting upon 
access and have interpreters in the IS, but in addition to that, you get alternative ways to develop leadership skills, whether that's through mentoring, coaching, it's a conference. If you're working the same job, you're in your app, perhaps uh, working with exchange, being creative about how we build and develop deaf people and leadership skills. Not only in the old traditional ways, but the various alternatives that exist to broaden the mind. To open, open their eyes up to various opportunities that may exist. Job sharing is another example. So, working alongside hearing individuals, foreshadowing. There's many options that could be made available to us. But also shifting the perception of why to why not. So if there's any opportunity for individuals to lead or learn, why not make it happen? You should be automatic, you should make the commitment. Don't give excuses around why we can't, because we don't have the time, we don't have the funding, this person's not ready. Why don't we make it happen and give them the opportunity? What can go wrong? We'll always learn from our mistakes or successes. And the individual can develop and improve. So this photograph is the world of the camp in Brisbane. I can't really think of how I've been that camp. It's a, a group photo, but looking at that, that again, I think of all the chaos in that photo, we're going to make to our kind of networking and skill development. And some of you uh, attended the camp in Paris, in the room. And uh, camps, as you would agree, are extremely worthwhile events. And I hope that we see more of that nationally. I know we're kind of, uh, well, unable to travel, but we certainly have something. I know that the World Youth Camp was held back in March, so it was certainly a valuable opportunity for people to attend. Hopefully, this will continue. Right. In this photograph in Brisbane, I remember I was quite young at that age, I was about 19, I was asked to bring a makeup. And looking back, I think I should have been a participant in my makeup, but I only came in 2003, I returned a participant, and that was fantastic. I'll talk a little bit about my journey. So as I said, uh, growing up my family were vital. Uh, I was born into the deaf community. Obviously that was my first language, my like little preference of uh, role models, like my parents, my friends, my parents' friends. And I was completely immersed in the community. And I had wonderful role models such as John Lovett, an incredible role model. And I remember as a young boy, John working at the Deaf Society at the time, and just as well as he invited me to meet the work experience, giving me like five dollars a day, or sort of five dollars a week. But I was so excited I could speak finally and you know, <coughs> stuff that was in envelopes that I would see David Peters, Greg Colbert, Kim Kavanagh, all those extraordinary individuals who learned from those deaf people. And then here another example of work experience or, or internship that was extremely valuable. And I think we don't see as much as those on offer now or young people going through those experiences. And I certainly benefited from that. At about 15 or 16, a big thing at the time organised a youth group. It was called Climate Deputies Youth Group. I was involved in and I had similar peers who were involved in activities and camps and so forth. And a short time after the deputies established the new business enterprise called the Yap Yap. And it was a national program, government funded where young know, people got together and set up a business and they could sell shares, make a product or a service. So, and who could like find younger people through the support of the big debt without the economy and supporting us at the time? We became managing directors of the business and we were about 10 or 12 of us. And we had created a box of shorts, hands on them, and we sold them. And they were incredibly successful in the We sold shares, we won a couple of awards. And the implication was that we learned business skills, marketing, how HR function, finance, manufacturing, all those components, and we get together our JCC on a regular basis and talk business. It was incredible. We haven't seen a program like that ever since, which is sad. And it doesn't mean that organisations like Expression Australia can't reform something like that moving forward. The business skills are incredible. And I think commercially, those business skills will be of high value particularly if you want to see deaf leaders in this space and are going to develop those types of skills. And at the same time, 
they call her with her back meal that I said to the FG. Senior and people say, oh, I remember that year you heard clips, and I'll report that a year and say, oh, I remember that three. And I'm uh, going to an age of being um, 17 or 18, and suddenly I'm going to be like, oh, okay, sure. And I remember Philip uh, Waters was there, I was sitting next to him, and we got chosen. And then uh, and Darwin, Barry Darwin, all, all those people, the Hutchins were there, you know, um, supported us. And, Became vice president, Phil Harper, and resigned as manager. And, uh, they were looking for a new manager at that time. Back in, was that 1999? Nobody was interested in the role that advertised, but somehow I thought, well, maybe I should think about it. I remember being on the TTY with Ben Darwin, calling her and saying, Do you think I should do this? I was like, I said, I'm not years old. And Ben was like, Yes, you should. Um, we sort of thought of all these other people, but if you put it out, other people on the board, we've got these skills and skill sets. So, something for you guys in the room to think about, perhaps. So, I applied um, after the uh, advertising period closed and I got the job and I was 19. And really, it was a huge step in my leadership skills and experience. Uh, it was one of the, uh, and then England, Beckett, and um, the PK and the working holiday and so forth. But looking back, PCOD really kick started my journey. It gave me the opportunity and saw the potential in me. This to me gave me good support. It was a great wonderful community at the time. They always made themselves available to coach me and I progressed. But looking back on my life, so much to think of. If it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here tonight, I'd be somewhere else. I don't, I don't want to think of those members who existed at the time. I went to the UK, worked for an exercise over there, you can see Big Bird had a great CEO there at the time I worked under. He was a, a coder himself and then an ally who really saw potential in me and supported me and shadowed me a little bit. And then I came back, uh, again for the Pacific Air here in Melbourne in 2005. Yeah. So he had started the work in the organisation. The global connections was extraordinary. And then I transitioned to the Board of Gifts Sports Australia. And I remained there eight or nine years. I was president for seven or eight years. And to lead the national gift organisation. So the skills that I acquired through the Sports Australia came from the college, the budget, doing financial reports, management reports, how to uh, run meetings, moving motions, learning about all those key aspects. I left that in the college. And I was able to show that knowledge and be a good president at this Force Australia and run meetings because of that background. And then I came to work in Expression Australia here for eight years and progressed as manager, general manager, and director. And then now I'm currently working for the NBIA in the executive space. So I think the most senior person in the NBIA means that through my experience there, I can increase one and a half times more people who have a disability. So getting a, a large percentage of those, we're looking at 30% of the external force, it's about 25% to increase the number of people with disability in the employment sector. There's plenty of opportunity for me to share some of my life experience as a deaf executive member about interpreting deaf people with people with disabilities. So my primary role is employment outcomes, but there's also opportunities there to influence uh, people there about deaf community through my career, my experience, and how I navigated the hearing world and experience barriers, jobs, job interviews. So much opportunity there for me to be able to influence a national strategic level. And I've only been there seven or eight but it's been a wonderful ride so far. And a few people that are working in the IA currently, they're probably the first or second largest employers of deaf people in this country, I think. Yeah. Uh, we're sharing interpreters and we have interpreters now. I think interpreters are always seem to be working at the end of the So the common thread is that I've always been around people that have been role models, coaches, and had the opportunity to be able to be exposed to those role models and communicate directly. And through that, I've been committed to regular learning and development and training. I did a rest of my life as I did my MBA, AICD course, various other short courses. And it's always important to look at continuous learning, keep up with training and practice throughout your life and your career. 
So that it's been paid, so that it's been voluntary, are combined. It's important in terms of the work that I've done in the community and making an impact in what you can So they're the key uh, things through the thread of my journey. But also all the individuals who believed in me and invested in me time and time again. So I've been extremely fortunate to have that experience. I just wanted to touch on allyship that term. And we've seen it come up on numerous occasions, but what's important now is to think about deaf leadership. What's our role? And should it be deaf only? Should we have other people in the space we can work with to be successful and break through the glass ceiling in terms of deaf leadership? This photograph I found from last night, this is a new photograph of my two children, they both can hear. I was in Steph signing the ABC News, and I'm very proud of the ABC News, ABC 24 and a 79. The kids were sitting there signing away and copying what Steph was signing. It was very cute. And they do that often, it's lovely. And it's an example of the fact that they're not deaf, but they're supporting us through the love of the language, their appreciation, and their value of the deaf community is coded children. So they are our allies. I wanted to talk about ally and what then this actually means. So if you think of the concept in terms of the in-group and the out-group, deaf people have generally been on the outer. But the people who are in might be hearing people, coders, work colleagues, uh, school colleagues, what have you. And they use their positions there as an insider to promote and advocate human rights and social justice and awareness to advance the interests of the people on the outer. So just keep that in mind. Who are our allies? They could be work colleagues, family members, school friends, hearing people, coders, interpreters. And there's so many people out there who really are passionate skilled individuals and in any place and all they want to do is support and encourage deaf people in the right direction. Yeah. However, it is a sensitive topic and it has been for the last 12 months, particularly with the media interviews. Why are interpreters being interviewed on television? Why don't we interview a deaf person who may have seen Netflix, Deaf You, that clearly talks a lot about deaf elitism. The A group of deaf elites, the B group of deaf people. A lot of discussion about privileged allyship, what does that mean? And we are our own worst enemy because we like to put our deaf people down and talk about the syndrome. That debate's been occurring in the last year or so and it's really interesting to see those conversations happen. MJ Benefit, so you may have seen this person speak about the university but have spoke about linguistics, advocacy. This individual talked about allyship and gay representation and street language conference in the States a couple of years ago. But the title was, Allyship is not an identity. It's a lifelong process. But building relationships based on trust. Consistent and accountable. With marginalised individuals and groups. Allyship is not self-defined. Never call yourself an ally. Our work and our efforts must be recognised by those who wish to support. So the deaf community needs to recognise an ally. If you want to hear the person who comes into this space and says, I am or am I, it's a privilege that's earned. So there's five principles of allyship. One, listening to us. Nothing about us and about us. Two, three, create, protect, and value, and foster, and embrace their space. Keep resources, opportunities, and political power within the deaf community. And they're important to remember. Thank you for our ship on the road. So you're not just an ally when you're in the deaf space, you're an ally out and about perhaps go on speaking with the hearing of family members who have no involvement whatsoever in the community. Talk about what a wonderful community have, differentiate 
the language we have, be in our life, how dare the external world advocate in our behalf. Again, this came from a speaker from street language, and this street levels of accountability. So, looking at boundaries, how I ship. And first of all, you need to understand what it is to be immersed in it. So, understanding it, the place, the community, the language, the culture, you need to understand that. You can't be in our life and don't understand much. You grasp that concept, be known with the boundaries, line, and the parameters. How far do you stretch the parameters or boundaries that you don't want to lean into? Patronising behaviour or tokens. And that's something you can truly realise that you're truly realised right now. I watched a, a recent presentation, the recent presentation of me, uh, they talked about the word process is the same. The same sign here, Oslan, process is a very perfect example of knowing yourself as well. You really form it, but you're also reflecting it and you're reflecting as you perform it. You can't be a perfect ally straight away. You need to reflect on people, perhaps you don't make a mistake, maybe it's not the one so that I should keep give a different purpose and opportunity. So you're always looking at opportunities to reflect in a way. And you can self evaluate this means that you can become an incredible ally. And what's important then here in Australia in the Victorian context, because we don't have a flock of thousands of dead people, we're a small community. We can do a lot ourselves, but also we can do a whole lot more with our allies. And I've worked with some of the greatest allies especially in Australia, historically, in the NDIA I've identified a few allies who have been fully supportive and then we've all worked with us and they know their place. But I think we should talk about that topic more to the future. Because I think when Jeff is going to be on TV and criticise the topic, we should be giving people more than what we need to give them in that space. But there is a time, there is a place where it's okay to bring that person if the timing is right or it's appropriate, or being interviewed with a deaf person. And you need to look at it case by case and look at that on its own merits. But there is a place for allies to be at the forefront. It is appropriate when you have the appropriate frameworks in place. It's a safe space. We have those conversations. We agree and identify with each other for all of us. We can work together, we can succeed much better than we can for our own. Victoria, so I've got two photographs first. A group of very young and deaf people. The Peacock sponsored and then paid for those people who gave a prison to the Congress, not the camp, but the Congress. We did a lot of fundraising back in car washes, uh, and those systems of deaf people were funded to go to prison, and a couple of them now are in the high professional jobs in the UK and leadership roles. So, certainly, was a worthwhile investment way back then. To see that now we are actually looking at the fruitful of the awards. Anyway, um, so investing to better the food that's from it. So investing in our territory is being seriously promoted in that respect. But I invested in me, and I was a conservator that is pronounced. And the other photograph is uh, Phil Hartman and Jim Kavanagh, who were on Bico at the time, and I've seen the white board there that says definitely issue. Actually, see the background in that photo. So it does demonstrate that we're talking about devolution. It's not a new topic, it's going on big on all the issues, but we're talking about devolution for eons. Deaf Australia, the board, Deaf Victoria, we're probably talking about devolution. There's been a lot of talk, but not necessarily a lot of action. That's from time to back out and talk and have a trip in action. It's important time for us to be able to see action take place. With Deaf Victoria, I mean, they should embrace the knowledge and celebrate their role as kickstarting many deaf people's successes in leadership roles and journeys. Because of the work of Deaf Victoria and Pink Party, many people weren't ready. 19 years of age, I didn't think I was ready. I'm a country manager, I'm the best of people, and I saw the opportunities and had a bit, you know, support. I could have drowned. I wasn't the end of the world. I had everybody there to pick me up and put me on the way. But there's many people out there who I see who are part of this organisation, whether they were staff members or community members. This group of people is really territory in this time to be working higher up in expression on the IA or elsewhere in higher roles. And uh, we certainly need to give different so much credit for exposure, experience, and training of 
or die. We can't be buried and celebrate that cancer. You know, if you're in our business, you have income, you've got company funding, you've got KPIs that you need to have. But by the same token, you still have a space and have permission to invest in potential young, humane, energy young leaders. And also, I think what's really important is that Deep Victoria facilitates thought leadership, like the conversations around how I share. It's really good to get the ball rolling, have those conversations, whether it's in Zoom, to interview, getting people talking about how I share, deaf leadership. Getting the conversations happening out there. It's not to be topic, you should be open to this, but you proud to talk about these issues and different people can play a pivotal role in that. Partnering, obviously, partnering with Special Australia and Victoria, I think that partnership between the organisations is absolutely vital to the success of many different people. So, the different people who work as staff have also had experience on the board, boards of any kind and somewhat been feeders into the organisation. So, there's been benefits both ways. And look at those partnerships, maybe we can see more opportunity for the different people in the future. The partnerships are incredibly important to build up for. the financial report, you've got $250,000 that is done. <laughs> Service in the budget, you should allocate that to a differential income strategy. So, in a good, if you are in a good financial position compared to other aid organisations like the FX and so forth, they are struggling. You've got money in the bank um, to pay them, so do your best. You, know, you will get return on investment. And if you find the account of errors once a year and it's $15,000, what have you, you will get the best of this, no doubt. It may not be directly, but potentially be directly. For people to go on skills conference, become leaders out there, and then becoming ambassadors and advocates who certainly will bring them all towards a place to provide some money, whether it's scholarships or whatever. I'm looking at you and Kathy, so you know, Kathy, I'm trying to encourage you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also, there's some support around the tech sector. Against societies, advocacy organisations, business. Think about that. There's a photograph here from uh, Heather Harker from Gallaudet University who came out to the AGM in Expression Australia about three or four years ago. And I remember the girl, we had a business breakfast and she came to a group of young people at the business breakfast, um, mostly female, and they had an extraordinary, inspiring, uh, inspiring conversation. All that I can see something you are recognised, but inspiring conversation where they were totally immersed in everything that Heather said as a deaf person from Gallaudet University came out of the United States. So I got to meet a deaf role model. I had the time and space and to have those conversations and learn from somebody like her who was prominent. And that was a deaf space where people got together at a business breakfast um, to learn and have great conversations. I think for any deaf organisation, you need to really embed best practice incorporate several components of deaf people, the deaf community, pretty much everything you do. So whether you have a committee or a work group, a subcommittee, whatever it is, just ensure that you have deaf representation on all levels. Uh, maybe a finance subcommittee, for example. If you can't think of somebody, there are people out there who would have reasonable skills, accounting skills, to be part of that. And they can learn, observe, and develop in the tradition all these individuals. And you also say nothing about us without us. And at the moment, the default for many organisations that exist is that the hearing person comes first and English is the first language. So all we need to make translations, also video is secondary. All we need to do is secondary. It's not an Auslan first. The default should be deaf first, Auslan first. The English can come later. It's always that we have to adapt to the hearing in English ways. Recruitment processes. If you look at a new CEO, how do you recruit that person? Is it a Western hearing way or model for selecting a CEO? Are you looking at their business skills, how they interview in a hearing way using spoken English and not thinking about a deaf person, how they communicate, looking at their deaf lived experience, what's the investment, what could you receive upon return? And I went for an interview recently, and the first step in that process was a, a screening 
process that that conversation was about my hearing aids. And did you wear hearing aids? Oh, wow, I need to have a few years off that. I think I'm here for Greta's sake to talk about my skills. And it was all about the medical model about my level of hearing loss. And it was done in a hearing way. So if there's no deaf way or a production, a new model, or a way of seeing things, quite a lot of these examples are seeing some deaf leadership recruitment processes, deaf led systems. And if we don't have one here in Australia, we can't design one. The, the realization overseas in which you could evolve to a hearing way of doing things. We're looking at, okay, the deaf person has to be not trying to do it in a deaf way, getting the hearing people to have, have to uh, modify and look for a change. There'll be so many opportunities more than what's occurred in the past when operating in that fashion. Ensuring processes are fit for process, uh, purpose. I was saying before, so fit for deaf leadership. Purposes. So every step of the way, you need to stop and ask yourself, if we do this, will this equal translate to a deaf person benefit of skills and exposure? And if yes, that box, if not, go back and ask, how do we build this thing or incorporate equity-based decisions, program making, policy, just in making what have you, where do we get people with exposure, skills, and benefit? Because there are systemic barriers that exist, no doubt, in the moment of stroke. Spoken English, hearing people, why do you hear speaking people do things? What about our world and our sector? We should be able to go through that process seamlessly with our own experiences. And also with an ally, we need support their buying. That's incredibly important as well. I think that pretty much wraps it up. Time for me, do we have time for questions? But um, I'd like to say this well, thank you to Dr. Troy for inviting me all tonight. Um, I hope I've provided some food for thought around the friendship of other females in the room. I'm very fortunate to have had such a positive journey and opportunity that's been incredible. But also the concept of paying forward is what I'm doing. I'm here, I'm sharing my thoughts, I'm giving you advice, paying it forward, and I hope that you can do that for others into the future. One person can't do everything, we need to be engaged as a whole. Thank you.